On to today's witness. Today we'll hear from Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell on the Fed's monetary policy in the state of the U.S. economy under law. He comes in front of us twice a year, the minimum. The Federal Reserve plays a key role in making sure our economy and banking system uh, work for all Americans. Chair Powell, thanks for your years of government service and for your testimony today. You're recognized. Thank you. Uh, Chair Brown, Ranking Member Toomey, and other members of the committee, I am pleased to present the Federal Reserve's semi-annual monetary policy report. At the Fed, we're strongly committed to achieving the monetary policy goals that Congress has given us, maximum employment and price stability. We pursue these goals based solely on data and objective analysis, and we're committed to doing so in a clear and transparent manner. Today, I'll review the current economic situation before turning to monetary policy. Over the first half of 2021, ongoing vaccinations have led to a reopening of the economy and strong economic growth supported by accommodative monetary and fiscal policy. Real GDP this year appears to be on track to post its fastest in rate of increase in decades. Household spending is rising at an especially rapid pace, boosted by strong fiscal support, accommodated financial conditions, and the reopening of the economy. Housing demand remains very strong, and overall business investment is increasing at a solid pace. As described in the Monetary Policy Report, supply constraints have been restraining activity in some industries, most notably in the motor vehicle industry, where the worldwide shortage of semiconductors has sharply curtailed production so far this year. Conditions in the labor market have continued to improve, but there is still a long way to go. Labor demand appears to be very strong. Job openings are at a record high, hiring is robust, and many workers are leaving their current jobs to search for other ones. Indeed, employers added 1.7 million workers from April through June. However, the unemployment rate remains elevated in June at 5.9%, and this figure understates the shortfall in employment, particularly as participation in the labor market has not moved up from the low rates that have prevailed for most of the past year. Job gains should be strong in coming months as public health conditions continue to improve and as some of the other pandemic-related factors currently weighing on them, weighing them down, diminish. As discussed in the Monetary Policy Report, the pandemic-induced declines in employment last year were the largest for workers with lower wages and for African Americans and Hispanics. Despite substantial improvements for all racial and ethnic groups, the hardest hit groups still have the most ground left to regain. Inflation has increased notably and will likely remain elevated in coming months before moderating. Inflation is being temporarily boosted by base effects as the sharp pandemic-related price declines from last spring drop out of the 12-month calculation. In addition, strong demand in sectors where production bottlenecks or other supply constraints have limited production has led to especially rapid price increases for some goods and services which should partially reverse as the effects of the bottlenecks unwind. Prices for services that were hard hit by the pandemic have also jumped in recent months, as demand for these services has surged with the reopening of the economy. To avoid sustained periods of unusually low or high inflation, the FOMC monetary policy framework seeks longer-term inflation expectations that are well anchored at 2%, the committee's longer-run inflation objective. Measures of longer-term inflation expectations have moved up from their pandemic lows and are in a range that is broadly consistent with the FOMC's longer-run inflation goal. Two boxes in the July Monetary Policy Report discuss recent developments in inflation and inflation expectations. Sustainably achieving maximum employment and price stability depends on a stable financial system, and we continue to monitor vulnerabilities here. While asset valuations have generally risen with improving fundamentals as well as increased investor risk appetite, household balance sheets are on average quite strong, business leverage has been declining from high levels, and the institutions at the core of the financial system remain resilient. <clears throat> Turning now to monetary policy, at our June meeting the FOMC kept the federal funds rate near zero and main maintained the pace of purchase of our main maintained the pace of our asset purchases. These measures, along with our strong guidance on interest rates and our balance sheet, will ensure that monetary policy will continue to deliver powerful support to the economy until the recovery is complete. We continue to expect that it will be appropriate <clears throat> to maintain the current target range for the Fed funds rate until labor market conditions have reached levels consistent with the committee's assessment of maximum employment, 
inflation has risen to 2% and is on track to moderately exceed 2% for some time. As the committee reiterated in our June policy statement, with inflation having run persistently below 2%, we will aim to achieve inflation moderately above 2% for some time, so that inflation averages 2% over time and longer-term inflation expectations remain well anchored at 2%. In assessing the appropriate stance of monetary policy, we will continue to monitor the implications of incoming information for the economic outlook and would be prepared to adjust the stance of monetary policy as appropriate if we saw signs that the path of inflation or longer-term inflation expectations were moving materially and persistently beyond levels consistent with our goal. In addition, we're continuing to, continuing to increase our holdings of Treasury securities and agency MBS securities, at least at their current pace until substantial further progress has been made toward our maximum employment and price stability goals. These purchases have materially eased financial conditions and are providing substantial support to the economy. At our June meeting, the committee discussed the economy's progress toward our goals since we adopted our asset purchase guidance last December. While reaching the standard of substantial further progress is still a ways off, participants expect that progress will continue. We will continue these discussions at coming meetings. As we've said, we will provide advance notice before announcing any decision to make changes to our purchases. We understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. The resumption of our Fed Listens initiative will further strengthen our ongoing efforts to learn from a broad range of groups about how they are recovering from the economic hardships brought on by the pandemic. We at the Fed will do everything we can to support the recovery and foster progress toward our goals of maximum employment and stable prices. Thank you. I look forward to our discussion. Uh, thank you, Chair Powell, for your testimony. Our economy looks a whole lot better today than it did last year. We still have a long way to go, yet many of my Republican colleagues have been stoking inflation fears, demanding that we pump the brakes on our economic recovery, complaining that we're just investing too much money in the American people. If my colleagues are suddenly concerned about the costs that have been rising for workers and families for decades, they can join Democrats in the fight to raise wages, to lower the cost of health care, to make housing more affordable, to pass the American Jobs Plan. Of course, most of them won't say aloud what all this inflation alarmism is really all about. It's simply they don't want workers to have more power. In reality, the biggest risk to our economy, Mr. Chairman, is, our econ is not doing enough to empower workers and not doing enough to curb Wall Street greed and excess. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, we Chair Powell, my question is, you've, you've supported Vice Chair Quarles as the Vice Chair of Supervision, his efforts to weaken capital requirements of the largest banks through revisions to the stress capital buffer, and you oversaw weakened CCAR stress tests, only, which only decide how leveraged the biggest banks are. Uh, Governor Brainerd has pushed back against your efforts to weaken financial regulations. President Rosengren of the Boston Fed made the case that strong financial regulation enables the Fed to be more aggressive in its full employment mandate. President Mester of the Cleveland Fed, President Kashkari of the Minneapolis Fed are outspoken in the need for the, bar, for the board to keep its eye on financial stability. Weakening financial safeguards doesn't help working families. It just increases the risk of a financial crisis, wiping out everything they've worked so hard for. We're finally making progress, as I said earlier, and workers are getting a, a better seat at the table. Uh, we can make the economy safer and fairer with higher capital requirements of the biggest banks. My question, Mr. Chair, is why, why have you been against stronger capital requirements in using the countercyclical capital buffer in curbing runaway executive bonuses and stock buybacks? So I guess I would say with... Um the stress tests, <clears throat> the severity of the stress tests has very much been maintained. The effect of the stress capital buffer overall was to raise capital requirements for the largest firms. Uh, and they, they did uh, manage to get through the, uh, the, the recent uh, pandemic and the acute phase of it and, and the recovery and did their jobs during the, the uh, so I think, our, I think that our, by and large, our uh, financial institutions are well capitalized. Uh, we limited their distributions during the pandemic and their capital levels actually rose quite materially during the course of the pandemic. So financial system is strong and the banks are strong. Um, I, I have felt and I've said on a number of occasions that, that the level of loss absorbing capital in the system is about right. I think the experience of the pandemic bears that out. 
um, I would be prepared to deploy the, the, the countercyclical capital buffer uh, if I thought that the conditions we laid out were triggered, uh, but I haven't so far felt that way. Every time the Fed is, thank you for that answer, every time the Fed's taken action to lower capital standards, it claims that doing so would increase lending in the economy and would and otherwise promote economic growth. That hasn't been what's happened. Instead, buybacks, dividends, executive compensation have continued to go up even during the pandemic. We empower workers by maintaining tight labor markets and strong financial regulations. I believe strong financial regulation enables the Fed to be more aggressive. That should be your mission. It's time, Mr. Chair, respectfully, you change the way you think about regulating the biggest banks. One other question, Mr. Chair. In addition to adopting pro-worker financial stability policies, the Fed can further help communities of color by leading the push for a strong update to the Community Reinvestment Act. We've seen some good developments there with a with a different oh, so a different controller of the currency. Last year, the Fed unanimously released a framework for modernizing CRA that was well received by representatives of of the civil rights community and by banks. My question, Mr. Chair, is the Federal Reserve still committed to full, not piecemeal, full CRA modernization with an interagency approach, and what is the timing? We're very much committed to that outcome, and I actually feel uh, I feel good about where we are on this. We're resuming our interagency discussions on it, and I, I'm optimistic that we'll, we'll come out with something that has broad support among the community of intended beneficiaries, and by the way, also among the financial institutions and that it will be a, a good, solid updating after many years uh, into, the, into the more technologically enabled era that will, that will help all uh, help the intended beneficiaries quite a bit. And the timing, Mr. Chair? We're working on it now. I think you'll see, uh, you'll see, we're reacting to a very large, and analyzing and reacting to a very large quantity of comments and discussing that with, uh, particularly with the OCC, but also uh, the FDIC, it's not clear what, what their role will be at this time, but we hope they'll join in. Um, I think we'll, we'll be making visible progress in coming months. I can't give you a, a finished date yet, but I think we're, we're moving now. Okay, thank you. We will be watching. Senator Toomey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Powell, in your testimony, you said that uh, <clears throat> substantial further progress is still a ways off for the economic recovery, and, and I think you cite that as a justification for the extremely accommodative policy that you have. Um, I don't think you're referring to the need for substantial further progress in GDP growth. Um, I think it's employment that you're thinking of. Um, the unemployment rate has declined dramatically, but it hasn't reached the pre-pandemic lows. Um, and I think there, you've also made references to the workforce participation rate. I guess my question is, isn't it entirely possible that for a variety of factors, not the least of which is legislation that we've passed, the labor force participation rate may not get back to the record highs that we recently saw and we've made it more difficult for the unemployment rate to get back to the record lows that we were at before and do you take that into account when you determine how much progress we've made towards full employment so what was happening toward the end of the, the very long expansion longest expansion was that people were staying in the labor force later into their careers and so labor force participation consistently may, remained above all estimates of where it was going to be then what happened in the, in the pandemic was a lot of those people retired so there have been right. really significant amounts of retirement so the truth is um, we don't know where that's going to settle out and it'll take a period of years uh, for us to really understand what the new trend is. I, I don't see that as uh, as a problem for uh, the standard we've set forth for tapering asset purchases, which is substantial further progress. We're, we're not going to need to know the answers to, to those questions to, to make a decision that we've made substantial further progress. It will be more of a, a consideration for raising rates uh, where we've set a higher bar. Um, okay, I just I just uh, hope there's a, a, a focus on the distinct possibility that we're just not going to get to those levels anytime soon. Let me, let me turn to housing prices a bit. Um, the Case-Shiller Home Price Index showed home housing prices in, across the U.S. as a whole increased in May by more than 15 percent from the previous year, and that wasn't a base effect. There was no big decline in, the, in May of last year. 15 percent clearly is making housing less affordable, more out of reach for more people. 
So a number of voices within the Fed seem to be increasingly concerned about this. The St. Louis Fed President James Bullard said just this week that he is, quote, a little bit concerned that we're feeding into an incipient housing bubble, end quote. Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan said that the Fed should begin tapering to begin offsetting, quote, some of these excesses and imbalances, end quote. The Boston Fed President Eric Rosengren raised alarms that the Fed's mortgage-backed security purchases may be contributing to the current boom in real estate prices, citing the potential financial stability impl implications. I, I guess, you know, I've been clear for a long time, I've been very skeptical about the uh, ongoing mortgage-backed purchases. Are you at all concerned about the unintended consequences that are associated with $40 billion worth of mortgage-backed security purchases that continue month after month? So housing prices are going up, as you mentioned, around 15%. This is a very high rate of increase. A number of factors are contributing. Monetary policy is, is certainly one of those factors. There are also other factors. People have uh, very strong balance sheets, so they're able to make down the payments. There are also supply factors that are constraining the supply, at least temporarily. So purchases and MBS purchases for this purpose is not a large one. Probably MBS purchases are somewhat somewhat more supportive of housing. That's not their intent, but that may be the effect. Really, the larger point is that monetary policy is supporting this. And, and that is something, that's a discussion we're gonna be having uh, as on an ongoing basis. We, we, we talked about some of these things at our last meeting, we'll talk about it at the next meeting in, uh, in a couple of weeks. I, I think that's important. Let me close with a question on a central bank digital currency. Um, during your testimony yesterday, um, I sensed what I wasn't sure but thought might be a change in your tone about the uh, virtues of a uh, central bank digital currency being issued by the Fed. Um, one of the things you said yesterday is that one of the stronger arguments in favor of a CBDC is that, quote, you wouldn't need stable coins, you wouldn't need cryptocurrencies if you had a digital U.S. currency. Of course, isn't the reverse also true? Uh, if you have stable coins, uh, cryptocurrency is in use, then maybe there's no need for a central bank digital currency. I guess my uh, uh, two points. One is it's my view that the development of a central bank digital currency by the Fed would require congressional authorization. I'm wondering if you share that view. And secondly, it is still not clear to me what problem a central bank digital currency would solve. And I wonder if if you think there are problems that only a central bank digital currency can solve. First, I'm legitimately undecided on whether the, the benefits outweigh the costs or vice versa or on a CBDC. Yesterday, I was answering a direct question about a particular argument. I said, for, for in favor, that would be one of the stronger arguments. I would agree that the, the more direct route would be to appropriately regulate stable coins, which we're not, we don't do right now. And that's, that's gonna be a very important uh, thing that we do do. Um, uh, so in terms of congressional authorization, you know, uh, there are different views on that. I, I've said publicly, and I think this is right, that we would want very broad support in society and in Congress, and ideally that would take the form of authorizing legislation as opposed to a very careful reading of, of ambiguous law to support this. It's a very, very important initiative, and I, I do think we sh should ideally get authorization. In terms of the, what the problem is to solve, that's I think that is exactly the right question, and. You know, I think our obligation is to explore both the technology and the policy issues over the next couple of years. That's what we're going to do so that we're in a position to make an informed recommendation. Um, but my, again, my mind is, is open on this, uh, and I honestly don't have a, a, a preconceived answer to these questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator, uh, Senator Menendez of New Jersey is recognized. Uh, Chairman Powers, the Federal Reserve seeks to fulfill its mandate of uh, maximum employment. I want to discuss with you the tremendous impact that immigration has on the labor force. Isn't it true that over the past 10 years, the immigrant labor force participation rate has been consistently higher than that of native-born workers? I, I believe that's right. Yeah. I, and let me, let, let me help you verify that. The St. Louis Fed noted in their study that as of June 2021, the foreign-born labor force participation rate is 3% higher than the native-born rate, and that gap hasn't ever been lower than nearly 2% for the past 10 years. And an important but often overlooked characteristic of these immigrants is their youth. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, 71.8% of foreign-born workers are between 
25 and 54 years of age compared to 62.2 percent of the native labor force. So as the American labor force ages, will immigrants and therefore immigration policy play an increasingly important role in maintaining a healthy U.S. labor force, therefore a healthy economy? So, I'm, Senator, I'm going to stay away from uh, making any recommendations on immigration policy. It's not in our wheelhouse. I will say that uh, labor force growth is one of the two things that can drive the, the top line, the other being productivity growth. And, um, uh, you know, in recent years, labor, uh, immigration has been a significant part of, accounted for a significant part of growth in, in, uh, in the workforce. Well, I appreciate that. I'm not asking you about uh, immigration policy. What I am saying is that uh, a, one of the newest studies shows that nearly one in four Americans is projected to be 65 years of age or older by 2060. So while America gets older, the overall population is growing at a slower rate than it has in almost a century leaving unfilled job openings in a future American economy. And I, I think we should be looking at our immigration policy, whatever that might ultimately be. I have my own idea, the U.S. Citizenship Act, as a source of dealing with the labor market. Now, let me continue on the question of the labor market. One part of the Fed's dual mandate is to maximize employment in, uh, as a key to helping achieve that goal. On page seven of your monetary policy report, uh, and I'll quote directly from it, the effect of the pandemic on employment was largest for workers with lower wages, for workers with lower educational attainment, and for African Americans and Hispanics. And these hard hit groups still have the most ground left to regain. And the pandemic seems to have taken a particularly large toll on the labor force participation of mothers, especially Hispanic mothers. That's very much true. So have disruptions in childcare due to the pandemic had a negative effect on employment? Yes, they have, and also schools being closed. Uh, care, caretakers generally are having a hard time getting back into the labor force because you know, of that reason. The Federal Reserve's data shows that the pandemic's effect on childcare caused 9% of all parents to be unable to work late last year. Uh, and an additional 14% of parents had to decrease their hours. And this effect was especially pronounced among black, Hispanic, and low-income households. So is the effect on childcare, on employment, isolated only to the COVID pandemic? Sorry. Could you... Is the effect of the availability of childcare that is affordable on employment isolated only to the COVID-19 pandemic? I'm, I'm going to... Uh, guess really that the answer to that would be no. Uh, yeah, and, and it is no. Uh, studies have shown that working families pay uh, for childcare ending up 35% of their income on average, five times more than what the Department of Health considers affordable. So uh, the same Fed study I just cited notes that reducing or offsetting the cost of childcare has a particularly strong employment effect on black, Hispanic, and low-income uh, uh, families. The pandemic showed all of the inequalities in our nation highlighted in a way so dramatically, uh, and particularly communities of color. Uh, now, the employment challenges, we all talk about wanting to get people to work, the employment challenges that people have in being able to work, and they, as, a, as I have shown in the Fed's, St. Louis Fed statistics, more, more gainfully employed the native born, it seems to me we should be working on making the pathway easier so that businesses can have qualified workers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Rounds of South Dakota is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Powell, once again, it's good to see you, sir, and I have most certainly appreciated the uh, the time that you spent trying to not, not only educate us, but also to work with us. I understand that clearly you've made it uh, your mission to adhere to the guidance uh, for the Fed in which you work to maintaining 2% inflation over a period of time, as well as full unemployment or full employment. And when we talk about it, it's always a combination of which one you're more focused on and how you maintain that, while at the same time responding uh, appropriately in a, in a non-political way to the actions of Congress and the administration. I'm just curious, um, 
With regard to, to today's position, we, we're coming out of a pandemic. Uh, we've uh, put a lot of fuel into the economy with direct payments and so forth. And people are trying to get back to work right now. And yet we've got inflation, which right now in this current state seems to be above a 2% rate. Can you talk a little bit about the measurement time period that you believe is appropriate for shooting for a 2% goal? And if, if there is a concern that you would express or that you follow up with when we talk about overinflating or perhaps putting fuel in, uh, what, what concerns you would have and how, how you would, would uh, respond to congressional uh, activity? So um, the inflation that we have today, what we said is that if inflation runs below 2% for an extended period, we want inflation to run moderately above 2% for some time. This is not moderately above 2% by any stretch. This is well above 2%, and we understand that. And it's also not tied to um, you know, the things that inflation is usually tied to, which is a tight labor market, a tight economy, that kind of thing. This is a shock going through the system associated with reopening of the economy, and it's driven inflation well above 2%, and you know, of course we're not comfortable with that. In terms of the test that we articulated, we said we wanted inflation to average 2% over time. We didn't tie ourselves to a formula to be anchored at 2%, because if they're not, there's not much reason to think that inflation will average 2%. So that's that's really how we're thinking about it. But what's the, the, thing, the challenge we're confronting is how to react to this inflation, which is larger than we had expected or than anybody had expected, and to the extent it is temporary, then it, would, it wouldn't be appropriate to react to it. But to the extent it gets longer and longer, we'll, we'll, we'll have to continue to reevaluate the risks that would affect inflation expectations and will be of a longer duration. And that, that's what we're monitoring. You've been very careful, and I've appreciated the fact that you have done your best to be apolitical in, in, in this regard. And yet, at the same time, we're going to have a debate about whether or not we need to add additional fuel to the economy in terms of uh, additional payments uh, to individuals. And the, uh, as we make that discussion, recognizing that you're gonna do your best to be apolitical and simply to respond based upon your goals of the long-term goal of 2% inflation and full, un full employment, how do you see this right now with inflation right now being the focal point? and yet the possibilities of more dollars being put into uh, this economy in, our, in this recovery stage. What concern would you express, if any, and I know that your job is not to give us advice, but rather to respond to, what are the tools available for you to try to maintain that long-term goal of 2% during a time in which Congress may very well be adding additional fuel to the fire, so to speak, for inflation? So w the way it works is we we watch what Congress is talking about and then ultimately and it reaches a point at which our staff will say that's that looks like it, it's got a good chance of happening and then we'll we'll put something into the, the staff will put something into the forecast and all of us will make our own judgment about about whether that was the right thing to do whether it's too big or too small and we, we never then take that into the public sphere and say, you know, please don't do that for this reason or that reason. It's really not up to us to play a role, as you know. But the tool, the tool that you would use so, would be within monetary policy of price of money. Always, um, the tools we have are, you know, in monetary policy is to raise interest rates, to tighten financial conditions more broadly, to slow demand down. And, and that's how you get control of inflation, and that's and, and that's what what you do at a time like this. Though policy is so accommodative, you know, it'll still be accommodative after we slow asset purchases, ultimately stop them, and then raise interest rates. It'll be accommodative for quite a while. But that's that's what we do, and that's what we will do uh, when and as we need to. In the meantime, we're trying to understand this this particular inflation is is just unique in, in history. We don't have a, a you know. Another example of the last time we reopened a $20 trillion economy with lots of fiscal and monetary support. You know, so we're just trying to be, we're, we're humble about what we understand, but we're, uh, you know, we're trying to both understand the base case and also the risks. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much.